Okay, so Jason asked me to do two things this morning, and I'm going to do the best I can. The first is I want to think with you about chaplaincy in bigger perspective, meaning I want to try to help you think about what's happening as far as we can tell in chaplaincy across the country in every sector where you can find it. This may seem boring, but I actually want to make the case that this is integral to the work that you do because it helps us sort of understand a lot of shifts in the religious landscape that affect your work. The second thing I want to do is talk very specifically about a project that Jason and I have worked on with Michael Skaggs with funding from the Louisville Institute. And I've interviewed lots of you. Michael has interviewed lots of you. I think I probably know your voices better than your faces. Um, but this is a project about port congregation relationships. And we are going to make some materials that we hope will be helpful to you. But before we make them, we want to talk to you about them to see if you think they're going to be helpful. Because if you're not going to use them, we're not going to make them. So the first half of this will be sort of more traditional big picture. And then the second will be like, this is what we've learned, this is what we want to do next, talk back at me, like, help us think about this. Does this sound okay? All right, so in the first sort of big picture thinking about chaplaincy in the U.S., what I want to try to do is convince you of two ideas. The first is that I think that chaplaincy is taking new forms in the U.S. as innovative religious workers, some professionals, and some volunteers use the form and the concept of chaplaincy to do different and broader work than in the past. And the second idea is that I'm starting to wonder whether chaplaincy work is sort of the religious dimension of the gig economy. So I don't know if you've heard about the gig economy. It's the idea that people put together lots of different jobs. You can hire someone to come and you know, put your pictures on the walls. People are driving Lyfts and Ubers. It's this idea of a much more flexible labor market where people put different pieces together. And if you follow the logic of the gig economy, you could make the case, not so much in port chaplaincy, but in lots of other places, that maybe people People don't want to invest in congregational membership anymore. They just want to sort of have a chaplain they can call as needed without that kind of background and commitment. So as we sort of look at some of the big picture um, numbers, which I'm going to show you a lot of in a second, what I'm wondering is whether these two things, first, chaplaincy is new, it's changing, and it's in lots of different places than it was before, and two, maybe chaplains or the religious workers of the gig economy can help us think about this. Um, to begin with, I think I'll start here. So this is Father Joe Baguetta, and I met Father Baguetta two years ago. He's a 70-something-year-old traditional Catholic chaplain priest who's worked for the past 38 years at the Metro Youth Services or Youth Detention Facility in Boston. So I sat with him in his office, which has this license plate on the wall, because he also used to be a chaplain to the state police, and we talked for about an hour. What he told me is that there used to be chaplains who were mostly, mostly Catholic priests in all of the youth correctional facilities associated with the Department of Youth Services in Massachusetts. In the 1970s, a commissioner cut the positions, leaving only one thanks to some creative maneuvering of the, end, of the then archbishop, and Father Baguetta has held that position since that time. He's responsible for 60 kids between the ages of 18 and 21 in his facility. And he talks about himself, he understands himself as a Catholic chaplain who cares for those that he can and tries to connect others with religious leaders in their own tradition. He leads unconventional masses, he told me, with rap music, and he visits all the kids on each of the three units regularly. Every week he also brings in a group of older women who he calls the grandmothers uh, to check on the girls in the facility. And he said he spends most of his time doing pastoral counseling, grief work, and handing out Crest toothpaste and Irish spring soap because they're better than the state versions to help him build rapport. He gave me a copy of the state statutes that enable him to maintain confidentiality with the kids. And he says only occasionally is he called to court to testify, only ever in a very general way about whether he thinks a kid is truly remorseful for his crimes. Father Baguetta grew up in the north end of Boston, and interestingly, he worked as a correctional officer before he decided to become a priest and then a chaplain with no specific additional training for chaplaincy. He actually built a Catholic chapel on the side of this state facility in a single wide trailer with financial support from the Knights of Columbus. He wouldn't let me take a picture of it because I'm pretty sure that it's not supposed to be there. And I think he didn't want me to go publicizing it. But he did share with me this newspaper article. And he took me. It's literally a single wide trailer stuck on the side of this state building. And it's really important to him that the kids go out of their building and into another building to have mass. So we, we went out of the building and into the other building. And the door was you know, falling off and whatever. But um, this single wide trailer is used on a very regular basis. So here's one example. 
Six months after I talked with Father Baguetta, I sat, I sat with a less traditional, more innovative chaplain who does what he calls community chaplaincy in Boston. So he was an African-American man in his 30s, a non-denominational Protestant, who first did chaplaincy work in prisons and through the sheriff's office. He did some clinical pastoral education training in one of the big Boston hospitals when he was in seminary, where he learned how to work explicitly with people from a range of religious backgrounds by listening, being compassionate, being present, identifying and responding to trauma, and working around family dynamics. So he works now for a nonprofit organization in Boston. It's a community organization in a low-income neighborhood. Some of the chaplains there are, or, are ordained and formally trained, while others are volunteers with limited training, and many of the volunteers have gotten their training through this group. It's called the International Fellowship of Chaplains. They do online and in-person like week-long trainings, and then they give out ID badges like this. And I actually met a police chaplain in Boston who, when I met him, we met in a grocery store, and he walked up and he put it down and he said, I'm a chaplain, and he talked to me about his credentials. So it's just a very different way of thinking about who chaplains are and what it is that they need to know. So the gentleman that I spoke with in his nonprofit community-based organization, they mostly provide support and advocacy for victims of violence and their families, many of whom are not connected to local religious leaders. So I sat with these two men, and I'm telling you about them, because I think that they represent two different points on a pretty long spectrum between more traditional and more innovative approaches to chaplaincy, a field that's increasingly being called spiritual care. There are two of 66 chaplains that I interviewed in Boston in the last 18 months when conducting field work for a book that's tentatively titled God Around the Edges, Moral Frameworks in Times of Crisis. So why am I doing this? What's the big question here? There's a, a religious studies scholar named Winifred Sullivan, and Jason wrote a great review of her book that was in one of your publications. She wrote a book in 2014, and if you want to read one book about big picture chaplaincy, this is the book you should read. It's called A Ministry of Presence, Chaplaincy, Spiritual Care, and the Law. And she calls chaplains secular priests or ministers without portfolios. She says that chaplains are strangely necessary figures, religiously and legally speaking, in negotiating the public life of religion today in the United States. She's a religious studies scholar, as I mentioned. She has training in constitutional law. And she's mostly interested in trying to understand how chaplains and spiritual caregivers fit into political and legal frameworks. She talks about how they hold a space for, quote, the law to grasp the whole sprawling complexity and persistence of American religious life. And what she says, and what she's actually puzzled by in the book, is this idea that spiritual care is somehow mandated by the Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment. And she pushes back on that in different ways. I'd really encourage you to read the book. So what I'm trying to do with my project is sort of write the bookend to Winnie's book. There's the cover of Winnie's book. Um, Winnie's book is a lot about law and policy. The book that I'm trying to write is all about practice. And it's about who chaplains are, what they do, and why it matters. So not you in this room, but many people, when I talk to them about chaplains, of course, they talk about Father McElhenney. Uh, the chaplains that I found in the field in my interviews were less like Father McElhenney and more like Carrie Egan, who is a hospice chaplain who's re recently written this book on living about her own struggles with illness and then her work as a hospice chaplain. Anne Cansfield, who is the first out lesbian chaplain of the New York Fire Department, or Father Michael Judge, who, as you all know, is the chaplain priest who was the first victim of 9-11. While historically chaplains focused primarily on rituals, mostly in their own religious traditions, the chaplains that I'm finding and interviewing are more inter or multi-faith or maybe just more existentially oriented. They seem to be creating new ways to do this work in their interactions with the people they are there to care for, as well as in how they're situated sort of organizationally and institutionally. So I'm wondering, as I mentioned earlier, are these the religious workers of the gig economy, and are they present in many more organizations than they used to be present? That's an open question I'm going to come back to. So I live in Boston. I have two little kids. I can't travel very well or very much. So I focused in Boston, and I found chaplains in all of these places. Um, the Coast Guard, the National Guard, the Veterans Administration at the airport. Boston Logan had the, air, the country's first airport chapel, and I can tell you more about airport chapels and chaplains than you ever wanted to know. They were Catholic first. Uh, the Boston Police and Fire Departments have long had chaplains since the turn of the 20th century. State police, county and state prisons, including state hospitals, a wide range of colleges and universities, an equally wide range of healthcare organizations, 
retirement centers, hospice and palliative care organizations. Most exciting and interesting to me were the chaplains who work with both the Boston Red Sox and the New England Patriots, neither of whom agreed to be interviewed, uh, and community chaplains that work in organizations ranging from victims advocacy groups to Boston Healthcare for the Homeless to Still Harbor, which is a new organization that provides support for international medical workers. Before American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the World Trade Center on 9-11, the longtime Catholic chaplain at Logan Airport had been notified and started to prepare for an emergency. Chaplains were sim similarly on hand following the Boston Marathon bombing in 2013, caring both for first responders at the scene and for the injured at area hospitals. And every time a Boston police or firefighter is injured in the line of duty, a chaplain offers support to the officer, to the loved ones, and to colleagues. I was able to interview one of the previous uh, fire department commissioners, and we were talking about what I was interested in. He's like, oh, I have this box in my basement. I think it's from a chaplain. Do you want to see it? And I was like, yeah. So he literally brought up from his basement this big cardboard box that had these photographs. This is the chaplain that actually married him, and a book that this guy was writing, uh, the work that he had done at various big Boston fires, et cetera. So I mapped all the organizations in Boston I could find that I thought had chaplains, and then I, and I also um, have worked on a project about chapels, meditation, and prayer rooms in greater Boston that exist outside of congregations. I think I've talked with, this, uh, talked with you all about this before, but I have postcards. If anybody's interested in this, we found 65 of these spaces, and often I was able to find chaplains through these spaces. And I basically just tried to interview as many chaplains as I could to understand sort of who they are and what they were doing. To situate the chaplains in, Bo in Boston historically, I also worked with an undergrad, and we went through the Boston Globe and pulled all the articles that had the word chaplain in them at five-year intervals between 1945 and the present. And this is too small for you to see, but there's a paper coming out that I'll gladly share. Basically what we found, and part of the challenge here is anybody who studies chaplains, and there aren't very many of us, they know about ports or healthcare or the military. They don't look across. And when I interview these chaplains, they're all in Boston, they don't know each other, mostly. The only people who tend to know each other are African-American clergy who tend to be involved in the Black Mysterial, Ministerial Alliance, and certainly within sectors. The healthcare chaplains know each other. The port chaplains, of course, know each other. But it's, it's unusual for the airport chaplain to know somebody in healthcare, or a VA chaplain to know somebody who's doing you know, community chaplaincy work. So you've got all of these people out doing different things, but not kind of connected in particular ways. So the reason we looked at the Boston Globe was so we could start to look quantitatively about, about like where is there more attention to chaplaincy? How have the numbers of chaplains gone up and down? So basically what we found is that the largest number of articles in the Globe about chaplains focus on higher education, uh, chaplains working with community members, and chaplains working with the staff of organizations. Uh, also a fair number of chaplains in healthcare and in prisons. Uh, we're trying to, we sort of coded to see what they were doing, right? Are they bearing witness? Are they being present? Are they doing rituals? And we find division about a third, a third, a third. A fair number, and it won't surprise you because this is Boston, but a fair number of progressive chaplains were involved in the civil rights movement and other social movements. And it was actually the university chaplains in Boston that organized Boston clergy to go and mar march with Martin Luther King. So they've had a long history. We're trying to sort of sort that out. If we step back from Boston then, though, we have to ask a couple of big picture questions. First, who or what is a chaplain? And you all know that there is no standard agreed upon definition of chaplain, either in American public life or in different kinds of practice. So this is the Oxford English Dictionary's definition of chaplain, a clergyman who conducts religious services in the private chapel of a sovereign lord or high official of a castle, garrison, embassy, college, school, et cetera. Uh, Winifred Sullivan, in the book I mentioned, traces Christian chaplains to military chaplains who she says worked, for Frank the, worked in the Frankish kingdoms. She also has found them in private companies, including the East India Company. Um, today, I think that the term chaplain describes any religious worker, some formerly trained professionals and others not, who work or volunteer outside of explicitly religious settings in a spiritual or religious role connected to institutions. So obviously no longer Christian, there are Jewish, Muslim, humanist, and interfaith chaplains. This is a book my students love. Uh, most of the humanist chaplains that I've found are in universities, and this guy, Chris Stedman, wrote this book called Faithiest about what it means to be an atheist chaplain involved in multi-religious religious work in a college and university setting. He wears like super cool sneakers and he came to my class and the students all lined up to see him. I don't think anybody
everybody should be allowed to write a memoir before they're at least like 35. And I think he wrote this when he was 30. So it's a super interesting book to read. Um, I'd be curious what you think about it. So we're also trying to figure out how chaplains are sort of trained and how to count them. So no one knows how many chaplains there are. Some people estimate there are 6,000 chaplains that work for the federal government. The only places that are required to have chaplains in the US are federal government military, Veterans Administration, and federal prisons. Everybody else has chaplains by choice, including healthcare organizations. Healthcare regulations say that patients' spiritual and religious needs must be addressed, but they don't say a word about who it is that has to address them. Healthcare chaplains have tried for 50 years to lobby to get that change, and they've never been successful. Um, but we, when we try to think about kind of patterns over time, if you look at Google Ngram, Google Analytics are so fun. Uh, this is when you search the terms chaplain, spiritual care, or chaplaincy over time for mention in books. This is what you see, which suggests that there's been some decrease over time in the mention of chaplain in books, um, but a, a small increase in spiritual care. Another fun one to look at, these are searches for these same terms over time in Google. Um, this I did before the re big recent to do about the US House chaplain. Did you all follow that? And when he resigned and then went back. And so when you do this now, it has a big point that everybody must have been Googling around that time to see what was going on with him. So these are a couple of things that help us think about numbers. Uh, the question about where chaplains work, I mean, you all know. Some are volunteers, some are paid. In Boston, the most frequent place to see listings for chaplains are in hospice organizations, um, which is not a surprise um, to me. I've talked about how they're not required in lots of different places. In trying to count chaplains, I worked with a colleague who looks at data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and he did some analyses basically to try to figure out what fraction of everyone in the US who identifies as a clergy member works inside versus outside of congregations. And what this graph tells us is that between 1976 and the present, the fraction of clergy who work outside of congregations has increased, right? And when you divide it up by sector, the biggest increase is in the upper left is in healthcare, which is probably not surprising when we think about how much healthcare has grown. Um, but we're seeing growing numbers of clergy working outside of congregations, more in healthcare than in other settings. We also see, um, oh, I don't have it here. I think it's coming later. Um, we also see growing numbers of theological schools offering training programs in chaplaincy. And we have a research project going on now where we thought we could, would find about 20 US and Canadian based theological schools with a certificate or degree in chaplaincy or chaplaincy education. We found 83, which is 25% of all theological schools. The first program was started in 1998 and it's gone up exponentially since then. Just because I'm a geeky researcher, I have to show you the picture. Okay, so this is my whole talk just in um, numbers, which I'm not gonna show you because you'll throw me off the, off the mic here. Um, but we know that growing numbers of people are not affiliated with religious organizations. Theological school enrollment is declining. Christian theological school enrollment is declining and has been pretty steadily since the early 2000s. But the number of people doing clinical pastoral education, which is required for some chaplaincy training, is increasing. And when we look specifically at the residency programs that are required for healthcare chaplaincy training, they're increasing dramatically. These are the numbers that I already showed you. Oh, it won't pop them up. No, never mind. I'm sorry, I can't show you. We're trying to figure out what fraction of, um, within particular denominations or traditions, how are the number of people who are chaplains changing over time? Um, I got it. And what we can see is growing numbers of chaplains as a fraction of all clergy. Okay, so there, there's something going on here, which is part of what we're trying to figure out. Okay, so that might bring us to the what do chaplains do? And you talk to three chaplains and you get about six answers. Um, and researchers have tried in different ways to begin to um, kind of make sense of this. What I see from these data in Boston is that there are really only two things that all chaplains do, no matter where they work. The first is they almost all work around death, as death notifiers as they are in prisons, supporting people after they learn of a death, as many police and fire chaplains do, providing rituals for staff and family members around death, or just naming and being able to support people through the process of grief. 
I didn't ask in my interview guide a single question about death, and every single chaplain brought it up and talked to me about it. So this is the one of two commonalities I see in the work of chaplains. The second one has to do with what one chaplain called peripheral vision. And what I think about is helping individuals and institutions keep the big picture in mind, so not losing the peripheral vision. And this takes place in lots of ways, as you know, because many of you do this, through casual conversations, through more informal counseling, rituals, or in other ways. I'm thinking about a prison chaplain that I interviewed, and she pulled out bags of letters and other materials that inmates had shared with her over the years. In healthcare, there's been an effort to develop a typology, which is what this article points to, because increasingly in healthcare, people want to see the relationship between the work of chaplains and outcomes, like patient satisfaction, you know, length of stay, a whole set of things. So there's been a lot of research trying to figure out what we can see in healthcare is that patients who are visited by a chaplain are more satisfied with their hospital stays. We haven't been able to connect the work of chaplains to um, money outcomes, dollars, um, but we have a project called the Transforming Chaplaincy Project if you Google it and you can pull all the outcomes-based research. I don't know that it's going to help you in healthcare, but that's all we've got right now. Um, I'm not going to talk to you all about poor chaplaincies because you know about them already, except to say that uh, Michael and I published two papers this year out of the interviews that we did with all of you. They're up on my website. If anybody wants paper copies, I'm really happy to send them to you. Just give me your card and I'll send it to you when I get home. One looks at what chaplains do, and the second describes the history of port chaplaincy in Boston from the sort of turn of the century to the present. We're trying to sort of build the research literature in this area, in one hand because the research might help you, but also just to help people, academics and others, know what's going on with port chaplains. This this is the International Seafarer Center in, in Cardiff in Wales, and we have a project going on in Wales right now. We have a researcher named Nelson Turgo who is out on container ships. He did one, I think it was six or eight week voyage on one container ship, and now he's on a second one. I'm not going to tell you which it is because I was actually going to go visit him when he was in Boston, and my colleagues told me not to because it would screw it up. Um, but he's interested in basically how seafarers think about chaplains. Like, how do multi ethnic crews get along day to day on the ship, and what is the experience from the side of seafarers, of the role, the importance, the perspective of chaplains. We know quite a bit about what you all do from talking with you, but we really need to hear it from the seafarers side. So that's what this project is um, focused on. Helen Cardiff, who's written a number, she's one of the experts in, uh, a sociologist expert in um, sort of ports, is leading this up. Um, okay, so I talked about this. Um, Training for chaplaincy, I mean, I'm happy to talk more about it if it's of interest, but it's basically all over the map. And so what are we trying to do with all of this? And why is Michael helping me um, sort of through this process? What we're getting ready to do in September is launch a chaplaincy innovation lab. And I've got handouts here if anybody's interested in them. This is what the website's going to look like. It's not live yet. But basically the idea is... We, something's going on with chaplaincy. The numbers are increasing, there's interest in theological education, there's an effort to link to outcomes. When you look at the US context, you say, growing numbers of Americans have no religious affiliation and fewer are involved with congregations. The existential issues that, we're, that we deal with are not going anywhere. And particularly for people under the age of 30, more than a third of whom are not religiously affiliated, they don't have people to support them around the existential issues the way that their parents or grandparents would have gone to local clergy. This presents to us a kind of set of questions about who chaplains are and what role they are or might playing might be playing. My contention is that increasingly, especially for people under 30, if they meet a religiously or a theologically educated individual, it's going to be a chaplain. It's not going to be a local clergy member because they're not involved in local religious organizations. So the goal of this lab is to bring chaplains, theological educators, social scientists, and clinical educators into a common conversation to begin to think about what chaplaincy is, what the work is, where the innovation is, and basically how chaplains can learn from one another and from different people in this conversation to do better work, uh, to fail more quickly, faster, right? To sort of make the learning a little bit easy. So this website in September when it's launched will have every um, school with a, has, have a map with every professional association of chaplains we can find across any sector. Uh, this is a map of all of the theological schools that have degree programs. 
we have, I've popped my entire research database up, up here, which you may not want to see, but it's a Zotero file. So we're trying to make, we can't make the PDFs available because of copyright, but we can make available um, all of these articles. We then sort by sector, and so we have introductory materials for all different sectors of chaplaincy. We've done a kind of collating of podcasts and NPR pieces and any kind of videos and media about chaplaincy to make this easy. And what we want to do is go out with two webinar series that at the beginning will be offered for free. One is for people who are interested in chaplaincy, and we have different chaplains volunteering. I hope some of you will volunteer to be a part of webinar teams. Part of what we're trying to get the chaplains to do is talk across. So we want to know about port chaplaincy, but really we want to know about you know, responding to end of life issues and hear from a port chaplain, an airport chaplain, and a Red Cross chaplain, something like that. So we're going to organize thematically. The other is trying to develop a kind of mentoring program because increasingly we know, we have the data to show, people are going into theological school interested in chaplaincy, but every theological school has made up their program by themselves. The Association for Theological Schools doesn't have any common characteristics or common sort of credentialing mechanism for these chaplaincy programs. The head of the Association of Theological Schools has agreed to be on our advisory board. So we're launching this with an advisory board of 40 people. Uh, and again, more are welcome. Uh, to try to kind of really bridge the conversation and get the movers and shakers in the same room. The only sort of price to entry is an agreement to our three principles, which are everyone is welcome, uh, religious or not, spiritual or not, re regardless of what your background is. You have to believe at least somewhere in the way back of your head that research can make a difference. It doesn't make any sense to talk to researchers if you think that we're just kind of, I don't know, playing with Excel sheets. Um, and number three, that we're committed to respecting all differences, and we feel pretty strongly that um, each of us are responsible for our own experience, not for trying to convince other people of it. So we have a pretty kind of clear sense of proselytizing, not being a part of this effort, because we think by doing that we exclude some people. So we're going to launch this in September. What does this mean for you as port chaplains? One, we'd love for you to join our mailing list, volunteer to be on webinars, um, basically tell us what it is that we can do to be of support to you and kind of join us in the conversation. It's wonderful to work with Michael because he knows this inside and out, and we're very committed to being full partners with all of you in the best way we can. Second, the story that we're telling about Port Chaplaincy that's in the article that we published is basically when we, when we talked with chaplains about what you do, what we heard you saying over and over again has to do with negotiating security protocols to get on board vessels, negotiating the hierarchy of ships, in some cases negotiating your own self-presentation, how you dress and what collar or not collar will help you sort of move your way through, and then providing economic support, phone cards and other things, to develop the kinds of relationships with people that are central to your work. So I sort of imagine you as having a lot of hats that, because you play economic roles, you play moral roles, you play advocacy roles, you play religious roles. And so we see basically port chaplains wearing these different hats and creating a kind of invisible global safety net because as you all know, if you don't do it, no one else is gonna do it. So we'll be curious, I'm curious to know if you have a chance to look at the article or we can talk now if you think we're getting that story right. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about this sort of port chaplain congregation project because we're hoping, you know, with Jason and everyone's um, permission to have that. We're launching the lab also with 10 projects because the researchers don't know each other. And so we're just trying to build capacity. And this is one of the projects. So what I might say about this is that we got money from the Louisville Institute because our sense was that there was an opportunity to strengthen the relationship between you all and the, con and the congregations in your area. As we did these interviews, the question behind the question is why? Why is it important or is it important to strengthen these relationships? And what we heard in the interviews is that people have and want very different things through these relationships. Some people want volunteers, some people want money, some people want sort of connection to community in a way of integrating um, their work or the work of their volunteers or interns or the seafarers themselves into sort of what's going on locally. We don't see a single thing that everyone wants. And some of your organizations do this already. Some of you have absolutely no time or resources to do this even if you wanted to. And so seeing the kind of vast array of approaches what we started to think about is basically how could we be of support? And so the idea we have, but this is what I want to hear back from you, and if you think this is a terrible idea, tell me, I'm totally open to this. The idea is could we make a very short, like three minute video that says these are seafarers, 
This is who port chaplains are, and this is why it matters. Something would just be an introduction, not to NAMA, because the average person, with all due respect, doesn't care that much about NAMA. They're gonna care about the seafarers, right? So it has to be framed around the seafarers, but then about the work that you do for the seafarers, because if you're not doing it, no one would do it. And so could we make this little video give it out to all of you, and then think about, um, Steve Cushing, we, we were just talking, like an a la carte menu of things that we could make that you could then download whatever you want. So we could create materials for Seafarers Sunday that you could download and give to a congregation. We could create, uh, and many of you do this already, but materials or directions for ditty bags or hats with the idea that you could take the video and go to some local congregations that maybe you knew before, you'd like to know, you don't know if you wanna know, and have the video to introduce your work. And then you could ask them, you know, would you be willing to do Seafair Sunday? Here, I'll give you these materials. Would you be willing to do a Christmas program? Here, we'll give you the materials. So we're trying to figure out how to make it easier for you to kind of reach out and do this work when we know that many of you don't have the time or the um, kind of background, I have no idea how to make a video to kind of do these things. So the question is, would that be helpful? And is this a la carte menu the right menu? And, and we can talk about what should be on it. And or would it also be helpful if there are some of you that want to kind of join a sort of small group as a cohort, we could work with you through the year. So we could develop some sort of plan where you know, you're going to ask three congregations and then three of you or five of you or whatever are going to agree to have three phone calls through the year and sort of do a mini coaching and we could walk through the relationship building so you'd still have the a la carte stuff, but if it would help to have some more support or some people to do this with, we could do that. So let me stop there and just ask you. I mean, I'm happy to talk about any questions about the big picture stuff I was talking about, but in terms of what we can do now with the time and the money that we have left to be of support to you and the kinds of relationships that you might want to develop with your congregations or with people in your community, what do you think of this idea?